Hey YouTubers, it's MTK the Talktopus, and I'm here to talk to you. And today we're talking about a variety of things, not so much about nature, although if nature intervenes, since we're always out in it, as you can often see here in my lenses, then we'll leap into action. At the moment, out here in the field, there's not much going on. Pretty quiet, sun's coming up. There's a little bit of water out there, which is nice. So yeah, I said I wasn't going to talk about nature, but invariably I do. Why? Because I love it. I am very familiar with the slow decay and fade of the natural world because in my travels, a lot of the times I've seen places and then come back to see them and they're just so dramatically changed. In a lot of ways, I feel like a designated mourner. Do you know what a designated mourner is? A designated mourner is when... Uh, there's a man or a woman who dies and their family is doing their funeral um, and they hire someone to just wail and cry and mourn and that person's job is just to sit there and mourn the death and the passing so that is a designated mourner and a designated mourner is an interesting term that the playwright and actor Wallace Shawn turned into a play in 1996 which debuted in I believe in London and that I got to see in New York on the longest day of the year in 2001 uh, June 2001 uh, 21st uh, and The Designated Mourner is a two-act really interesting play I highly recommend you either uh, find a way to see the movie which is pretty good uh, I think uh, who, who directed that? Mike Nichols, maybe? Um, check it out. But it's not really about what I'm talking about with regard to feeling like a designated mourner. I feel like a designated mourner because every time I got someplace over the last 30 years, it died right in front of me. And when I say died here, I don't mean it died, actually. I mean died like, you know, it was cool and then it's just not cool anymore. Which uh, later turned into jumped the shark, if you want to say that which is a term I hate uh, that came up along the way. Jump to the shark actually starts with the 50s Fonzie doing the goddamn motorcycle thing over the shark, which is even worse reason. I was letting that show was really bad. It was so bad at that point, you know, like it was just hanging on by the tendrils of what you have even nowadays on the net. Pe fans just wanting it to continue type of thing. Not that I dislike Henry Winkler or, you know, Ron Howard or, you know, Gary Marshall or any of the people involved. It's just that it was at that stage of the show where, oh my god, nobody wanted to watch that anymore. Hence, Jump the Shark, right? So, I'm going to give you examples of that. My sister moved to Austin, Texas to go to college, right? And she was three years older than me, four years older than me. And uh, so then I moved to Austin, and when I got to Austin, Everybody there was like, oh man, Austin's just, now it's going to be all bad from here on out. Because it was 85, and the 70s in Austin, which if you haven't seen films by uh, Richard Linklater, you ought to, um, it was a magical time. Now I'd gone up there, of course, to visit and so on, and then when I went there, it was really good. I miss Austin in 85, 86, 87, 88, 89. And if you know me from those times, by the way, in Austin, 86 to 89, do me a favor and comment below, uh, contact me, you know, positive, negative, I don't care. If I wronged you, it'd be great to hear from you. If I wronged you somehow, or you feel wronged by me somehow, it'd be awesome to hear from you. I'd like to communicate with you, that'd be great. That'd be great, because if I can understand how you feel I wronged you, I'll be happy to apologize and do what I can to uh, rectify that. Or if you were a pal of mine from back then, it'd be nice to hear from you. That happened recently because I ran into Oris, Oris Tanner, my close old friend from the old days. He was my first manager at Amy's Ice Creams, which was totally hilarious uh, times in those days. But anyway, by 89, Austin was turning into the beginnings of what you see in the 90s when all of LA just arrived and rents went through the roof and the whole town changed and you can't park anywhere and you can't drive anywhere. So that all happened shortly after I was there and you could see the end of it so I was the designated mourner for this magical time before you know 
And then the same thing happened to me when I moved to the Bay Area. I left my heart in San Francisco. High on a hill. And it was an incredible, it's the time that made me a man. I became a man in San Francisco. 1993 to 1999, 2000. And uh, again, everything about San Francisco is completely ridiculous. And let's do that again. If you feel I wronged you in San Francisco in the 1990s or any time, I'd really like to hear from you. It'd be nice to hear from you. And, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why I ran for mayor, you may or may not have known that, of San Francisco in 2011. And you can read all about that on the blog that I put up for that. Uh, Karthik Rajan for mayor is what that one is. I'll put a link to that below. And then I moved to New York, right, because I was outgrowing San Francisco, I thought and it had gotten too small for me and I wanted to be an artist and a writer and so I was gonna move to New York you know and then when I get to New York it's the end of the 20th century in New York and New York is dying it is turning from Manhattan into Mallhattan Harlem is becoming Harlem USA Brooklyn is beginning to gentrify like the beginnings the Williamsburg Dumbo beginnings and I watch all of that so every place dies every place I go because I'm trying to escape the dying of its cultural richness and the uh, turning over of its soul to the corporate capitalized machine I go to the next place and the same thing happens there. So over and over and over again, I get priced out of neighborhoods. You know, I graduated from college in 1989 and I lived in lots of places, you know, uh, New Orleans, San Francisco, New York, um, Asia. And I never paid more than $400 a month in rent. I never paid more than $400 a month in rent until 2002. So I lived in a lot of these places where you people are living right now. I built out spaces that you're maybe even living in right now. And uh, you're paying up to, I don't know, some cases eight times as much money. And that's only 15 years ago. So the millennial explosion that's redefining America, that's all a result of the post 9-11 situation means that whatever we were in the late 90s is never again going to be considered American. So what, <laughs> what am I supposed to do with that? I was 33 in 2000, Jesus' age in 2000, not five. And now, of course, we have the problem that the group demographically above me is huge, the boomers, and they're getting old and need to be cared for and expensive and problematic. The group below me is huge, the millennials. And I'm in this middle group that's neither punk enough to survive, nor young enough and digital enough to survive. So the designated mourner that I was needs a designated mourner. <laughs> was I ever cool? If I was ever cool, if you knew me in New York between 1997 and 2002, and I was cool, or if you have beef with me, like I was saying regarding the other things, uh, get in touch. You know, you can comment below. Then I moved to L.A., and L.A. is cheap and nice, and it's a great place to have a child, and I'm in love with my woman, and I want to do this. We've been talking about it for a long time, and she has been teaching me how to be a father. And we, again, find great rents, and are able to live like Northern Californians in Southern California. And of course, it's where I made my biggest splash, if you will, on radio as MT Karthik, MTK on the MIC. And my partner was able to do remarkable things in publishing, and our son was born. 
magical times, and now, hey, that's the one place that's actually changed for the positive. All right, Los Angeles, for the first time ever, I'm gonna give you that one right there. LA. But, you know, come on, you want me back. Maybe, maybe not if they say it right. I'm owned by a lot of museums in LA, by the way, works of mine are. And one of my favorite writers in the world lives very nearby there. And I've been really enjoying communicating with him on Twitter. So if you follow my Twitter handle, you'll find out who that is. At MTKSF, where I left my heart. And um, it calls to me. MTK the Talktopus vlogging now. And uh, get in touch with me. If you knew me as Karthik or Kartik or Kartik uh, along the way, or as MT or MTK, uh, get in touch. Be nice to hear from you. Shoot a video of yourself and reply on YouTube. MTK50 as MTK the Talktopus is what's up.